Welcome to AI for Marketing and Sales. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy. And today is unit three, AI for images, social media, and ads. I want to welcome Nicole Donnelly and Jeff Cooper, my incredible co-instructors, as well as Olivier Kennedy of Enigma, a marketing agency based in Switzerland. So what are we doing in this course? What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to accomplish five things. We want to give you the context for what any business leader needs to understand about AI for business. And so as a result, we're going to be sharing with you aspects of um, how these technologies work, um, and that will help you understand their limitations. We're going to give you the skills, the specific skills that a marketing doer would need, such as prompt engineering and others, so that they can get the best out of these tools. We're going to share with you the different software, uh, the mainstream software that everybody's heard of, like ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion, and other cutting-edge software that you may not have heard of, uh, like Jasper, that uh, give you incredible access to the tools with a much easier interface. We're going to talk about the challenges around hallucination or making stuff up, security, bias, copyright, ethics. And we're going to also try to give you inspiration uh, with our guests, showing how they're using this today to save money, create content uh, that's better than anything they could have done on their own. The course is for two folks. It's for business leaders of, of businesses that are looking to leverage AI to grow and for the marketing doers. Now, you guys who have attended previous units will remember that I couldn't get Dolly, uh, one of the generative AI image tools to actually create the image. It was uh, way too uh, overloaded at the time. It, since then, I've moved over to Mid Journey and pay, gotten a paid account. So this issue is kind of resolved, but I wanted to leave this as a reminder that when you're dealing with free, when you're dealing with certain tools, they're still kludgy, they're still kind of overloaded. They don't always give you what you want. Uh, you know, even that business leader, you know, they render words really weirdly. Um, and so today we're gonna talk about how to do uh, AI images better today. And hopefully next week, um, me and the team will come up with better images for the business leader and the marketing doer. So stay tuned for that next week. Um, as a reminder, uh, this is the third of seven units. Uh, we, what I wanted to do now is in response to a lot of your requests, I wanted to address what we've covered in sessions one and two. The first thing is we talked about what is AI? AI stands for artificial intelligence. And we're talking specifically about a kind of AI called generative AI. What is generative AI? When you prompt or you tell the AI tool to do something, it does it and it spits back out to you a product. And that product could be the draft of an email, it could be a piece of code, it could be uh, a translation, it could be a poem, it could be an image, it could be a video, it could be audio, it could be any set of things. Um, what generative means is that it's brand new, it's created from scratch, it's never existed before in the world, and as a result, from a copyright perspective, it's yours to use. So that's what generative AI is, and the most common, uh, the way you make um, AI, generative AI tools work is through a, a, a technique called prompting, and prompting is just like an instruction that you input into the AI tool, whether it's Jasper, ChatGPT, or MidJourney, and then it spits out a product. And so the art of prompting effectively is called prompt engineering. So you're gonna hear us talk a lot about the word prompt. We might throw around some jargon like prompt engineering. All that means is kind of garbage in, garbage out. If you put in a good set of instructions, you'll get a good output, but you also have to massage it. Um, the main AI tools that we've talked about so far are called ChatGPT, created by a company called OpenAI, where Microsoft is a major investor, and then a private company uh, tool called Jasper, which is an incredible uh, tool. Now, ChatGPT is free to use GPT 3.5, and you can pay, I think it's 20 bucks a month right now to access 4.0, which is much more powerful, uh, but you can access that for free. Jasper is not a free tool. You do have to pay for it. So that gets you caught up to where we are so far. Um, as a reminder, next week, we're gonna be talking to someone from Microsoft, a lead engineer there. But today, today is all about AI for images. We want you to understand the basics of how AI for images works. 
at the significant limitations. We're going to start with that and then talk about what's on the horizon. We want to get you introduced to the three leading AI image tools, plus an in-depth demo of MidJourney. We also are going to talk about Canva, which has AI built into it. And that's a place where many of you already are. Uh, it's a great uh, graphic design program. And then finally, you're going to see how an agency, Enigma, run by Olivier Kennedy, uses AI-generated images plus human touch-ups to get stunning uh, imagery at a fraction of the cost for their clients. So buckle up. Here we go. So the first thing we want to do is, of course, every week we ask for you guys to do a piece of homework. And what we'd like for you to do is share with us what you were up to in the past week. So uh, as a reminder, last unit's uh, homework was to use ChatGPT to draft a sales email to a potential client or business partner. <laughs> I should have said comma, edit it, comma, and then send it. Um, I'm curious if any of you guys did that. Uh, let us know in the chat. And if you did, tell us how it went. Um, were you able to draft a better uh, email or more emails in a shorter amount of time than you might have done otherwise? We're going to now talk a little bit about AI and you. AI and you. And what do we mean by AI and you? What we mean is how much are you using AI? Each week we ask you in a poll the same set of questions. And I just launched that poll um, now, uh, which is how are you using uh, AI in your own businesses? And so please let us know how you're using AI in your businesses. And while you do that, we're going to share the results from last week. And what's really cool is we're starting to see a trend towards more of you using AI tools in your business. And we like to believe uh, uh, that that higher percentage is a result uh, of your attending these classes and getting the benefits of these classes. So um, how many of you uh, use AI? Uh, First of all, the number of people who ask what is AI has shrunk in from a quarter of you to just 10%. I hopefully it's going to be 0% today since I've defined what AI is. Um, and about 17% of you, 18% of you are using it for only business, 15% for only personal, and well over half, nearly two thirds of you are using it for both. Um, and so what you can see on a week to week basis is an increase uh, in usage of AI. And as a Kind of learning outcome we really just want you to start playing with these tools now the next question was how many times have you used chat gpt in the past week my answer would probably be five to ten i've been traveling a lot not as many um 10 uh 25 of you have used it five or more times in the past week uh, um one or two uh times uh, 38 percent and about 20% of you have done it to three to five. Now, 13% of you still are wondering, what is ChatGPT? Again, ChatGPT is the easiest, most accessible, most popular tool for AI for text. And um, to find it, just Google ChatGPT uh, exactly as it's written, and it'll show you the interface. You log in and you use it, and it's just a chat bot. It's really easy to use. Um, as a result of its ease of use, more than uh, 100 of you uh, by far have used that tool more than any of the other tools. Um, one of the things about this question is you can now select multiple options. So if you've used multiple ones of these tools, you can select all the ones that are relevant. And thanks to the 57% of you, percent of you who've answered so far. And then finally, have you saved money or made money? Somebody said, what about if we made money um, using uh, chat GPT? Now on a personal level, uh, I've saved tens of thousands of dollars, all of it with relation to translating one of my courses from English to Spanish. Um, and I was able to cut down the fee that I have to pay for those translation services by more than half. Um, so I'm in that kind of sub 1% of us that have saved tens of thousands of dollars, uh, the 1% of us. 15% uh, have saved hundreds of dollars, 1.5% have saved thousands. And so far, most of you have not saved or made money using ChatGPT. I genuinely believe that if you leverage these tools, correctly and, and consistently, you will save or make money using them uh, by either saving the time, increasing the quality, or allowing you to do more than what you could do normally. All right, let's do this. So first, I'd like to hand it over uh, to my colleague, Nicole, to share with her kind of her initial experience with uh, working with one of the generative AI for image tools uh, called uh, headshot uh, headshotpro.com. All right. Um, 
So this is something we're playing with. A lot of my business friends have made headshots. So I thought, okay, I'll do this. You put in 20 pictures of yourself, kind of different angles, smile, not smile. And it spits out initially 120 versions of you. And so you look at these and the one that's the largest on there, I thought, okay, that looks sort of like me. And if you look at the fingers, they're really creepy. I was, and sort of the bar was, if you see this person on LinkedIn and then I show up in person, will you be surprised at who you get? And so I asked my husband, I asked my team and I asked them to look at some of the images that I thought were the best. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny because they picked the same ones ish, but then if you get close, you'll see odd things about the hands and the eyes. And these were, well, and then the one in the gray suit in the corner does not look so much like me. And I think I've aged 20 years or something in there. And in this, I had more, my husband's comment was, they all give you more crow's feet than you have in real life. <laughs> or I have like face wrinkles that I don't have in real life. And most of the pictures they made me look older was his comment, which I thought was interesting. Um, and he said, well, she's pretty and she's pretty, but it doesn't look like you. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of weird to look at all these not quite you pictures. And if you want to go to the next slide. So first you look at it, you're like, okay, this is interesting. And then you see the weird bits about it. So there's the very, there's the older version of me. They kind of turned my blonde hair gray and there's a whole series of those there's the hands and where it's like backwards fingers and it doesn't quite have those right and in the headshots there's actually a lot of hands there's a tiny hand holding a tiny cell phone that looks like a clicker or something <laughs> that showed up in there <laughs> this is so weird and then the eyes so if you look at close up at the eyes they're just not quite right and so as far as feeling comfortable posting them on LinkedIn, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with it yet. I think it's going to get a lot better, but this is where we are. This is one of the best tools for headshots that um, I'm in some AI groups and everybody agrees this is kind of one of the best headshots. And what I got from it was more um, style of hair clothes and what I should get you know I should have like a nice tailored jacket because that looks good and wear blue shirts more often <laughs> I love um, it yeah but this was kind of a fun fun exercise and then it doesn't look quite right and you're left with that feeling that odd feeling which I know Dan you're gonna go into a bit more yeah. So this is the best of AI right now. I mean you know you look at you look at that that first slide and you're just like, wow, that is a stunning, beautiful image. And then you kind of, your fingers trail down to those weird elongated fingers. And then, and then you start to kind of dig in a little and you start to get like really creeped out. And we're gonna actually, there's a scientific name for this phenomenon of getting creeped out by these photos. We'll talk about that in a sec, but I had this exact same experience. Um, I'm actually uh, joining you here from a conference. It's a, called the Small Giants Community Annual Summit. The Small Giants community is one of the great um, business organizations that I'm a part of. Uh, my, my colleague, Mike Pace, is here with me. Mike, if you could put just a quick link to the Small Giants community. It's all about how to be great rather than big. And there are about 400 of us who are all business owners and senior leaders at companies, like trying to learn how to be better human beings and better leaders and, 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 and run more customer intimate uh, companies. So that's where I'm at right now. And I wanted to create an image for a leadership academy I'm in about uh, being a small giant, loving small giant. So I kind of worked with uh, Midjourney uh, back and forth to try to get a kind of small giant with a kind face helping people image. And I finally got that image there on the left of that kind of giant guy helping a kid. I, I love that image. You know, the face, it's so kind. It honestly even looks a little bit like me. Uh, and And so I loved it. I was super excited. And then then I started looking at it kind of more closely and I zoomed in particularly on the hands because often what you're finding is the hands are where the AI is given away. And uh, you can see that uh, Picati, uh, Picado, um, 
showed all the different hands that generative AI has created and they're incredibly creepy. Uh, and if you actually get closer to the child's face, it looks like he's a burn victim. Like it's it's not pleasant. And so you look far away and you're like, well, that's so cool, so beautiful. And then you get up close and it gets weird. And then, well, meet Loeb. Loeb is a digital demon created uh, by Stable Diffusion, by a Swedish musician who used an, age, uh, an AI image generator with the prompt Digita Pintix. And uh, it's a little bit of a story of how they got to Digita Pintix, but that's what they put in. Uh, and what they got out was Loeb. And uh, Loeb has been uh, running around the internet. She's easy to recreate apparently, and um, she is incredibly scary looking. And so, uh, I would say as often as AI is creating beautiful, interesting images, uh, it can create lobes. And so our goal today is to kind of temper your expectations. Like on one hand, you know, a lot of us get frustrated who've worked with image for AI, uh, AI for images, because the quality of the product that we're getting is not usable. Um, and it doesn't have that kind of same aha wow factor, that AI moment that ChatGPT has. And the reason why is because it's a less mature technology, but it's coming. I mean, the fact that you can type words and get a wholly original image created, it's like a complete miracle. But a lot of us, you know, like when we fly on planes, we, we uh, you know, take for granted the fact that we are flying across the world and we're like complaining about sitting on the tarmac for 15 extra minutes. So right now don't let yourself get caught in the tarmac moment where you're complaining about you know the lost luggage or the fact that your uh your flight is delayed and just think about the miracle of the fact that we're flying uh in these giant hunks of metal with hundreds of other people and so with that um i wanted to hand it over to the amazing jeff cooper to talk about the state of ai for images to kind of give us a portrait uh, of the landscape uh, of ai right now great thanks dan um, well, okay. First thing I want everyone to appreciate is how quick we've developed these tools and how amazing they've gotten in the last 10 years. This is a comic from a, a publisher called XKCD, if you're familiar with that, where eight years ago, this was a joke. And this, in this comic, the business person is asking their engineer, we need to create an app that when a user takes a photo, it should check if they're in a national park. And the engineer says, oh, that's easy. Well, you know, we'll do a do a quick global positioning lookup and just give me a few hours. Then he says, we need to also check if it's a photo of a bird. And she says that she needs a research team in five years. Well, she must have gotten the research team in five years because nowadays, even though we used to laugh at this before, and you can go to the next slide, Dan, this is very easy to do. With this example on the right is an image classifier where you can put in a picture of a dog and have the technology figure out what breed of dog that is. This is an example from a company called Fast AI, where a student in school, a college level student, built this tool in about 25 minutes using the existing libraries and, and data sets we have. So we've gone from the last eight years, this being a, a, a joke to being able to do something like this very quickly and then being able to do generative AI. I don't know if you've seen the Pope in the puffer jacket. This was an image created with Mid Journey and a little bit of Photoshop that went viral around the internet. Uh, this is not a real picture. But not all of AI for images is generative. So in this lesson, we're talking a lot about using AI to generate unique photography. But in the wild, we also use a lot of image-focused artificial intelligence to do things like machine vision. So if you drive a Tesla or another electric car, all these autonomous vehicles rely on AI to process imagery. You see that in things like medical imaging. We've been able to make just shocking advancements and things like cancer detection using these tools, as well as things like security surveillance, or if you've seen any of the prototype Amazon grocery stores that were hot for a while, where you don't actually even need to check out or scan things because the machine is watching you shop. These are all examples of artificial intelligence for image in the wild. We're going to spend most of our time today on generative AI, but I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of how it's being used in other scenarios. One of the things that's important to realize is images are data. They are not just visuals. We as humans see the pictures, but under the hood, an image is basically a, a two-dimensional space of all these different numbers that correspond to the colors of things. Um, what's interesting is we've actually been using image detection to do things you wouldn't realize an image detector is used for. So for instance, on the left, what you have is what's called an audiograph. So this is sound turned into an image over time. What we found in the last three years is that it's easier to detect certain sounds like gunshots or children playing 
through image detection as opposed to using the historic tools we would use to actually listen to and process audio. So on the left-hand side, you've got an example where some researchers turned the sounds into images and were able to produce state-of-the-art results for detecting dangerous things like a gunshot. On the right-hand side, you're actually seeing a similar thing where somebody took someone's mouse movements on a website and turned it into an image that traces where the mouse goes, puts a dot if somebody clicks, and the color corresponds to how fast the mouse was using or moving rather. This, in this example, we were actually able to create state-of-the-art robot detection by actually looking at the data and using image processing techniques and artificial intelligence to take this, this domain of imagery and apply it to a lot more things in the wild. So, so there's very cool applications here if you get creative. Um, so how does this stuff work? Just like our large language models, all of this stuff is being driven by what's called a neural network. Essentially, these machines are trained. They take a bunch of pictures and imagery that are labeled, and they feed them through this large series of machines and math functions that creates a certain output predicting what a given image is. The, the way the machines do this, and you can go to the next slide, is they, they essentially break down an image into all of its core components. So the first layer of a neural network might look for gradients in colors or gradients in the image. The second layer might start looking for certain patterns like stripes. The third layer might start looking for more specific patterns like we're seeing circles or squares. The fourth layer starts to get very sophisticated looking for things like faces, et cetera. And fundamentally, this is how these machines take an image and classify it as, oh, this is a dog or a human or a car. And that was really the state of the union for how image AI was being used. But then we started reversing that process. So we said, okay, well, if we say we want a dog, a picture painting of a dog playing poker, uh, how do we do that? And the machine started reversing it. And so it knew what an eye looked like and it would start to extract that backup similar to image, image classification works to create these pictures. Well, when that happens, it gets very weird because the machine knows what an eye looks like, but it might produce something like this where you can see here you have what maybe looks like dogs if you're squinting or, or standing very far from your computer, but it's also the thing of nightmares where you see that we've got eyeballs and noses all over the place. And it's a machine, this is Google DeepMind, where it knew very well what a dog's snout and eyeball looked like, but it did a bad job of extracting that to a full picture. So this is essentially where we are right now. What image, what image AI tools do really well, like in Nicole's example, is when they're trained to do a very specific function. So right now, some of the best tools that are easy to use off the shelf for a business person have some specific use cases like this remove.bg is a tool for just removing backgrounds from images. You also, if you use Photoshop or Adobe AI, you're starting to see that these companies are incorporating AI power tools into their workflow. Um, so there are another set of examples here that when we send out these, uh, these videos, you can review as well. Yeah, a couple of quick notes. First of all, amazing, Jeff. Uh, I I think it's it's really easy to stop to not stop and ask, like, how does this plane fly? You know, how does generative AI for images work? Because it's a little different uh, than what what it, the way it works for text. It's a lot of the same uh, processes, but you know, the way it breaks down the images by layers. Uh, very well done. T two things here. One is. When you talk about AI for text, you can get a lot done with ChatGPT, which is a free tool. Uh, Jasper is a paid tool, it's a great one. Um, when you talk about AI for images, it gets a little bit more software-y. And so we're gonna start talking about more types of software. And when next week, uh, in two weeks from now, I should say uh, in unit uh, five, when we talk about AI for audio and video, it gets very, very niche software. And so we, Part of the kind of evolution that we're taking you through is from not very software dependent, you know, a chat based uh, framework to more software dependent. And as uh, Olivier is going to talk about, you know, the need for also, you know, more advanced editing skills in the Photoshop or Illustrator to touch up the product that's being produced. Um, all of these uh, uh, elements, these eight uh, photo enhancement software, the remove.bg will be included in a resource list that you'll get next week uh, as a thank you for coming live. And we only give those resources to folks who attend live. So I do hope you make it. So how generative AI for images works. It's really important uh, for us to kind of dig a little deeper in, into, into some of the uh, mechanics of this. And I'm going to invite Jeff back on to explain. Great, thanks, Dan. And I'll, I'll move pretty quickly here so we have time for 
for demos, but just reviewing from our session last week, when we talked about language models like ChatGPT and broke down how those work, there were really two stages. There was something we call in machine learning, unsupervised learning, where we trained these models on the internet. We used all the data we could find and we fed that into them to give them their initial training. Then we use something we, we do often with our own human children, which is we did reinforcement learning, where we essentially took the, the an original training that was given to the AI, had it practice outputs, and then we as humans told it what it was doing well and what it was doing poorly to have the machine change its parameters and get better at doing those tasks. That's exactly what we are doing with image models. So things like mid-journey stable diffusion. And just like Dan mentioned, we are getting more on the edge of cutting edge technology. As we do that, it's hard if you're not super technical to be able to understand all these things, that's okay. Over the next few years, these things will become a lot more accessible and easy to use, just like we've seen with ChatGPT. But right now, all you should really know is that these models basically combine a language model so we can understand what you are saying, like a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet. And it goes through a series of both text models and image models to take that and then produce the output image you see here on the right, which can look very different depending on what that pipeline looks like from a technical perspective. Um, how we train these models. Uh, we essentially took all of this labeled data on the internet of different images, airplanes, cats, trucks, and fed them into these giant machines. And Dan touched on this, I believe in our first session, sometimes we stole copyrighted images and fed them into these machines. So when you're producing content with these machines, you start to see scenarios where in certain cases, in, the, in this right-hand example, the, the model started replicating things it had seen, which was included the Getty Images watermark, which this actually did become an active legal battle. And so when you're using these tools, right now they are creating what is considered new content that is still an active debate happening in our legal system. So you probably will continue to see news articles about people suing each other for rights. We'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about AI for audio and some other use cases. But as of right now, there is no regulation that says this is, this is not something you can do as a practitioner. Um, and then we used reinforcement learning, just like the language models. This to me is, is the most exciting and, and shocking thing here. This red car example is just a basic prompt put into mid-journey, which has existed for about five years. And on the left-hand side is V1, in the middle is V3, in the middle, the right-hand side is V5. The same prompt, red car, we went from something that looks like a four-year-old child, or I guess myself, drew it. Uh, and then we, on the right-hand side, have what is a shockingly photorealistic uh, picture of a car. Um, and so this is happening very quickly and reinforcement learning is what we're doing to train these. There are hundreds and hundreds of AI image tools. You cannot go to Google or YouTube and, and not find something that you might be able to play around with. So you should just know there will continue to be a ton of these. Uh, I assume by the time people are watching this course, there may be five or 10 others that are very popular. Right now, we're going to focus on three that I want to make sure you guys are aware of because you'll hear them a lot. So in the current state of the market, there's essentially three tools, and this is an example from each one of the tools. In this prompt, we essentially said, I won't read this to you, but we essentially asked it for a very detailed kind of complex prompt like Nicole took us through last week and asked it to produce a picture of an older gentleman here that could be from a movie. Midjourney is a tool that is created by a company called Midjourney. So this is the company, and that's an example we're going to look at today and one of the three tools you should be aware of. That is only a paid tool, costs about 15 or 20 bucks a month. The second tool that's very popular right now is Dolly. And this is from the same company that produces ChatGPT. So OpenAI has a second product called Dolly. Now Dolly 2 is the, the version of the product that they provide to users that does image generation. This tool is also a paid tool. It works a little bit different, whereas Midjourney is a subscription. This tool, you buy credits and you can use those credits to produce images. The third really most common tool right now is a piece of software called Stable Diffusion. This is open source. What that means is you can actually download this onto your computer. It takes about 10 gigabytes just to hold all of the information in this model. And it's very technical. So it requires some engineering chops chops to really get this to work. You can use stable diffusion for free through some web interfaces. And this is the only sort of state of the art free image tool that I'm aware of outside of the fact that I think if you go to Bing, Bing has started to incorporate some stable diffusion tools into their search engine as well. Um, so right now, these are the three tools that most people are using. And these yeah, pictures and look amazing. Yeah, the pictures are amazing. Mid, mid journey is about right now, it's about 20 bucks a month. 
Um, uh, how much is a, a credit for Dali roughly? Do you know? I think I bought a $15 credit and it gives me something like a few hundred images to produce. Yeah. And then stable diffusion is free. The, the, the point is that they're not expensive, but they add up, <laughs> you know, because yeah. if you do ChatGPT4 for 20 bucks and Midjourney for 20 bucks and, uh, and then Jasper for 60 bucks and, and you know, Canva, it, it can really add up. So yeah. um, it, unless you have a real use case for it, um, try to use the free tools for playing uh, because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of money rather than save money, which is the point. Yeah. And if, if there was an option on that pie chart of our survey, if, if anyone's lost money with AI, I'm that guy because I buy every single tool in the world. And it's sort of like my Netflix and Hulu subscriptions. I'm probably paying hundreds of dollars a month for every tool, not the wisest idea. So here's a warning. These things, you know, this won't make you perfect. So these are the, we saw those amazing pictures of some older gentlemen that looked photorealistic. Here are three pictures that look uh, candidly pretty stupid. Uh, and these are produced by the same pieces of software with an equally complex prompt. So just keep in mind, they won't turn you into a great artist, but they are um, they are at least a good starting place if you're trying to get creative with ideas or if you have the ability or the bandwidth to wrestle them into submission or use other photo editing tools along the way. Yeah, so that's Kermit the Frog against the Dark Skull Wizard. Uh, and the only one that seemed to get Kermit right was Stable Diffusion, uh, but the Dark Skull Wizard, I think Dali. So maybe if if uh, Stable Diffusion and Dali could like partner, they would pr produce a decent image for us. Yeah, and we and, and I imagine in a year that these things will will be at a point where these types of bugs are, are worked out. Even the idea of hands, which we covered being so complex, some of the newer versions of these tools are starting to nail. So we're on the cutting edge here. If we, we wait a year or two, I bet we'll see some really cool stuff out of these systems. That was fun, Jeff. Thank you for that. Of course. So um, I wanted to kind of come back in. I had alluded to this a little bit more, but you remember um, Loeb, the kind of demon, uh, the digital demon that we introduced at the beginning. She actually lives in a place that philosophers call the Uncanny Valley. Um, it was attributed to a Japanese roboticist named Masahiro Mori. Um, I actually first learned about this when I was in college. I, I took a class with an amazing instructor at Princeton named Lawrence Wechler, and he wrote a book uh, or, or a, an essay, he used to work for the New Yorker, about the Uncanny Valley. And uh, what he said was, if you make a robot that is 50% lifelike, like C-3PO, that's fantastic. If you make a robot that's 90% lifelike, that's fantastic. If you make it 95% lifelike, that's the best. It's like the best robot possible. And then if you make it 96% lifelike, it's a disaster. And the reason is because 95% lifelike robot, that's actually C-3PO, you know, R2-D2 is more than 50% lifelike. Uh, the reason is if a 95% lifelike robot like C-3PO is a robot that's incredibly lifelike, but it still is the squeaks and walks like this, a 96% lifelike robot is a human being with something wrong. And that's what happened with Nicole when she was looking at her headshots. That's what happened with me when I was looking at the little boy talking to the small giant. And that's why Loeb is so disturbing. And this is the stuff, honestly, of horror movies. And they have actually documented in both moving and still images, this phenomenon called the uncanny valley. Those images that I showed you were uncanny. They were odd, disturbing. That's what uncanny means. They were just weird. Um, and uncanny is actually a philosophical term. So that's uh, where uncanny valley comes from. And what happens is that goal, that place where you go from 95% likeness to 96% likeness, you go steep down in the uh, familiarity curve and it suddenly becomes what we would mostly call creepy or even scary. That's the uncanny valley. And I would say a lot of image AI right now, uh, the better it gets, often we it's falling over the cliff into that uncanny valley where it's now creepy. And so if any of us who worked with AI for images totally knows, like we're sometimes freaked out by what it's creating. And you can see all sorts of examples from movies and other, other venues of life where the uncanny valley was in, un, unintentionally triggered. So one of the classics is Tom Hanks in the Polar Express. You can see that they made real care to like exactly mimic Tom Hanks, 
in that kind of digital avatar, which was clearly a drawing, and it was creepy. People did not like it. The movie tanked in the theaters. It cost hundreds of millions of dollars to the movie studio because they inadvertently found themselves in the uncanny valley. And uh, those of you who remember the CGI Luke Skywalker in one of the latest Star Wars movies, you know, it looks amazing until you like stare at it. And then there's this weird wax kind of quality to those eyes, to his skin. You know, it doesn't look quite real. It looks like there's like maybe a sheet of metal underneath, a, you know, uh, kind of a skin and he's going to rip off and he's going to be an android. I mean, it's very messed up. And uh, then, of course, the horror movies, Megan, um, the, the TV series Servant. Um, the, those are other examples of the Uncanny Valley. Uh, and then just everything, I mean, it seems like Madame Tussaud was like designed to cre creep us out. Uh, I guess people like it because it's been around forever. But, you know, when they did the Taylor Swift um, at Madame Tussauds, her fan base was up in arms because they were all messed, like they were all like really freaked out by, by her. And the part of the reason why is because it's so good. You know, you look at that and that looks exactly like her. I mean, uh, The Rock on the right, you know, you have to like really stare for a sec to realize which one is the real rock versus the not real rock. And so we're going to go actually uh, now into uh, in a second a, uh, a, a a little game of AI or not AI, and it's a fun game to play. So I did want to talk one uh, more kind of negative and even scary aspect of uh, AI and image generation, and this is becoming increasingly an issue that the better the technology gets, the more easily it's going to be able to scale this uncanny valley and climb back up that mountain. And what's going to happen increasingly is we're going to get completely faked out by what are known as deep fakes. So a deep fake is an AI uh, or fake generated image that people believe is real. And the better AI for images and video gets, and audio, the more we're gonna be faked out. And that's what the, the, the risk here uh, is deep fakes. And, and it turns out that people are terrible at IDing deep fakes with even existing technology. So if you look at those images and ask yourself, are they real or are they AI generated? And you can go ahead and throw it in the chat. Are those photos real? are those AI generated? You know, so if you look at them, you know, there's, you know, definitely, and they're all the same. They're either AI generated or they're real. Well, it turns out that those are all real images, but less than 10% of people can identify that those are actually real. In, in similarly, these following four images, are those real or are they fake? Those are actually all AI generated images. And when I look at these four and compare it to these four, I think these are the fake ones and these are the real ones. And the, the point is that the average accuracy of identifying deep fakes is less than 50%. So it's almost, they would almost do better uh, to just guess uh, than, than what they're able to figure out on their own. And so with that, I wanted to welcome uh, our incredible guest for today, Olivier Kennedy, uh, the CEO of Enigma Communications Agency. It's a agency based in Geneva, Switzerland, that thinks and communicates differently, harnessing the power of AI in their work to create original, influential, and innovative products. Uh, Olivier, ça va? Yes, really good. Thank you so much. Welcome. It's great to have you here and uh, take it away. Perfect. Hey, um, so I'm really honored to be with all of you and uh, I, I'm really happy to to share this moment. And uh, so I'm going to try, we're going to start by asking you, um, I'd like to ask you, so uh, is um, the image A or B, which one is done by AI, which done, which one is real? And um, you can put it, um, in so I can see A, B, A, B is AI, both AI, A is real, A is real, B is real. Okay. So it, it looks like we have both AI or A is real and some B. 
So the importance is what you think, because then we're going to see what it is. So um, I give you the, the result. So it's uh, A is the AI one and B the real one. And, um, and it's very interesting because um, I fully understand that A is much closer to what a photographer in an agency will bring out than the B, because in the B, there are some mistake in the way that the lighting is done. So basically, more mistakes, more real. Like, um, it, it goes quite far. Um, and then- and I, don't know about, I don't know about you guys, but I thought the one on the right was, was the, the fake because of its eye. You know, that little, uh, the left eye of the baby cat is like a little um, imperfect. Um, and um, that was why I thought that was the AI cat. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that idea that we have that AI is imperfect uh, here in a sec. But before that, let's do number two. Yeah, so number two, uh, I'd like to ask you, so all of those are done by my team. So um, uh, either uh, with a, photo, a photographer or with a, um, AI tool. So uh, here, what what uh, what is your thing? Okay. Hey, I'd like to apologize if I'm a bit slow today. Um, it's I started my job at six o'clock this morning and it's 7.30. So I'm doing my best. Had an early flight. Uh -oh. Time difference. Um, so, hey. Uh, All right, so what? Uh, yeah, you... yeah, interesting. So here you can see they are both done with AI. They are both done with AI. And um, those are the the state of art of what we can do using the best prompt we had um, with uh, two of our designer that em embraced uh, that embraced um, AI. Uh, it wasn't easy at start. They were all interested, but some of them look at it like, oh, it's going to replace us. And, uh, and I realized something just a bit earlier that we always have this feeling of, hey, I give one prompt and I see the result and then I judge this prompt the result of the prompt. That is not actually the way you work with AI. Usually you give a prompt, you see what comes out and you iterate, 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 iterate. And that's how you get to something amazing. But still the way we judge it is based on picture. I take a picture, I judge the camera and I judge how it works. That is not the way you judge in theory AI and I will come back on it. So here, both of them are uh, made by AI and basically they are too perfect to be true. Um, and the hands are well done because Mid Journey 5. So I did a presentation on Mid Journey 4 um, the day Mid Journey 5 came out. So I talked about the hand problem, but said next time, it's, I'm sure the next version is going to be better. And during the presentation, Mid Journey 5 came out. I had some images to show, and the hands were perfect. So let's remember that uh, today, what we see is 1% of what they will be in five years. And we have to be very humble. What I'm going to present you today is the best of what I found and what we found out. I'm sure that in a month and a half, there will be a lot of updates. And uh, so let me show you a few real examples of what we've created for a client that has been used. And I'll bring you through some use case. My, my team of marketers are in Switzerland in three different cities, and we work across all Europe. Uh, we even sometimes work in the U.S. for for some some um, uh, company that are based in Europe usually, and so I'd I'd like to show you what in, what real case we had. So uh, let's have a little look. First, I'd like to present you Nicolier. So Nicolier is a is a wonderful uh, swimming pool and spa maker, uh, and um, we had to do a campaign, and it's winter. And we cannot film or take pictures of their swimming pool now because most of them are empty and there's no way we can, we, we have to do something now. So we decided to do a concept saying, you imagine we make it real. You imagine we make it real. And then we thought, okay, let's go further. And we took the description of the dream of what Nicolia would like to make happen. And um, then we made uh, those visuals and they said, yes, we would be technically able to make it real if someone had the budget for it. And it's very interesting because it, it, it allowed us to go much further in what we would have done because let's remember it's a, it's a 
campaign we're going to do for two, three months. Then summer's going to come. We're going to be able to do shooting, and next year we'll have um, we'll have something great. And but but in between, we were not going to hire a three D studio, and that works really well. So that's a good example. Um, another example is someone who contacted us saying he would like one of those pictures with explosion of food to talk about a festival where you, during the whole day you can try uh, any type of food. And he showed us the kind of picture we wanted. So we showed him how we do that. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's with little wires. And uh, we have a photographer who know how to do that. So it takes roughly three to four days to plan the studio then one to two days to take the pictures and one or two days to assemble. I, I let you imagine the cost for one picture and he didn't have the budget. And we, we told him, hey, you know, we are interested. We don't know if it's going to work, but we would like to make it with AI. And because it's online only, we don't need a super high resolution. So let's try it. And we did it and it works and he was happy. And then he said, I need a bit more of this uh, uh, mayonnaise uh, um, or, or sort of cocktail sauce that there is, that is something that in a photo shoot, he would have had to be on the set um, for two days and to validate because we would have to redo everything to do that. And for us, it was like, oh, okay, actually, we're just going to change a bit the prompt and see what's coming out. And it worked and it created a very happy customer for something that was different. So it allowed us to fill a gap that we couldn't fill before. Um, so just to, just to try to be concrete, because when I say saving thousands or tens of thousands, this is exactly what I mean. So just round numbers, Olivier, how much uh, did, would, would uh, this have cost if you had used a professional photographer in a three-day shoot versus how much, if you don't mind sharing, did this cost? Five to 10K, five to 10K minimum. And if we take a photographer that is used to that, it's gonna be 12 to 20. Got it. So they, you charged five to 10K and it would have been at least twice as much. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And, and he, no, uh, we, we charge for this one in the end, I think we charge less than 2K. Ah, so, you know, you charge 2k it could have cost anywhere from 5 to 20,000 exactly yes so that's that's how you save money and the result is 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 not as good as it would have been if the professional photographer had done it you know if you really look at it closely you'll see it kind of dissolves a little bit uh, but it's more than good enough for the need because this wasn't a print magazine this wasn't a billboard this was an online uh, advertisement. And so uh, what essentially would have happened is the concept would not have happened uh, for the digital ad because he didn't have the, and now it did. So not only did he save a lot of money, your, your client, but they were actually able to do a campaign that they couldn't have afforded otherwise. And both of those are really important. Like, I think not only are you going to be able to do things cheaper and faster and better, but I also think you're going to be able to do things you couldn't have otherwise done because AI is allowing you to do things cheaper and faster and better. Mm -hmm. And a, a good a good question from Esther, is it cutting down our profit? Well, it took us less than 10 hours. So $200 an hour, I'm really happy. And if we would have done it in a studio for 10K, it would have burned for us much, much more than, um, than 100 hours. Uh, it, it would have burned much more because we would have put an assistant, we would have put a project manager, we would have put two junior to learn these techniques. And, and so in the end, the price per hour was higher there. Um, this is another great example that um, we at Enigma we like. Uh, you, you know, I want to I want to pause there for a second yeah, sure. because uh, Elizabeth Starkey, who does the kind of imagery that we're talking about um, in this picture, said in the chat, "This makes me sad, right? Because I would have done this uh, kind of creative thing. I would have been paid uh, for that, and now." Um, that opportunity might be taken away from me. And I, I would actually encourage you to think a little differently, which is what Olivier said right at the end, which is you will be able, to, if you master these tools, you will be able to get a better product faster to your client at a higher hourly rate. So you, a lot of that time, those three days spent, with that client might have been time wasted. And so you also are now gonna have access to a level of client that currently can't afford to pay you. 
So I would, I would try to just think everybody think differently. If you're a copywriter or a graphic designer, you know, even a musician, like AI is here. It's a reality. These tools are not going anywhere. The, the, the Pandora's box is open, but I do not believe that creative and knowledge workers are going to have to go away. Um, I think that there is still room for us and a need for us. Sorry. Yeah. I'd love to hear about this beautiful image. Yeah, I'd like to fully agree with you because um, it's not instead of, it's on top. This festival was two weeks later. We would have never be able to set that picture. It was only for Facebook and, and Instagram. We would have never, it would have never made sense to make that kind of cost. So that was filling a gap. So it's it's something else. And um, and it doesn't make artists totally obsolete. Let, let's look at this example. So uh, at Enigma, we have this in our branding. We are we are uh, putting ourselves as explorer, explorer of new way to do marketing. So we usually have images of exploration, and uh, at very high cost, we made a video that present um, the Enigma concept of uh, a sort of the why of Enigma, and this use image of space. That was very hard to do. We use image from the NASA that are free of copyright, and and now that I see the kind of image that my my two colleagues, uh, Alex and Clément, make, I'm like, wow, it has made our video completely obsolete and we can redo it using that and it's much better. And and uh, and this is fascinating because then, then I ask my colleague, okay, so you give me the prompt and I can be as good as you. And my colleague Alex laughed and said, no, the, you, you know nothing about design to beat me. And I was like, oh, come on, I, I'm a director of a marketing agency since 15 years. I know nothing about design. So no, no. Um, no, you you don't. Like uh, a, a, I'm a trained designer, so I know history of art. So what will happen is that when you prompt, you don't know how to refine because you don't have the vocabulary. When you prompt and ask, I want a door to the space, you don't know what type of architecture you 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 know what type of architecture in your head, but you don't know how to transform it into a word that will be understood by the machine. And I do. When you want to name architects you can name five top of your head maybe 10 I can name a hundred and I can name a family of them so I can have a discussion that is much more productive so I'm not scared at all my knowledge of history of art makes me a better prompter a better prompt engineer than you and I, I thought oh it's a bit the same I know how to use illustrator but I can't make a good logo but technically I know how to use illustrator and that it's it's a whole different thing to make something great with that. So uh, let's let's go to the next slide and see. Um, so uh, is it already that? Oh, um, yeah. So what we see today is only a fraction of what will come. Um, and uh, eight weeks ago, they would they are things that I would have tell you that would have been different because there are stuff where we believe eight, eight weeks ago that we can. Um, we can create images that outbeat real images in A-B testing in ads. So it means that because data beats opinion and I'm not creating art, I'm creating marketing. So marketing marketing elements, we judge them with a KPI. So uh, an in, a key performance indicator. So what we did is we did a test with fully AI content generated, um, uh, content that was generated fully by AI that we test on to do community management on Instagram and LinkedIn. And look, we looked at the numbers and basically purely AI generated get outbeated by human by a factor of two. Today, let's see what's coming today. But what comes next is if you have a human using AI, then what he makes beat by a factor of three or four, the human alone. So human alone beat the machine, you may not only be the robot, but the cyber beat them all. So we come in the age of the cyber. Um, so uh, the way we practice it is we build a spell book. So uh, Alex came with this idea of the spell book. Uh, and she said, hey, um, it's a spell book because basically I use word to make reality. So it's spells. And uh, I, can, I, can, I can give you that. I, I, I cannot give you more than those images. But... I can see, you can maybe see, for example, she used vaporwave versus reality, and then or vaporwave versus space. And she's gonna get, give weights 
two elements and say, if you say, I wanted vaporwave 0.5 and I want space 1.5, it will give that kind of result. So she tests results. And then another thing that she use is uh, she say, um, to go fast, you need to say to the, to the machine that you're working with, do resolution 0.25, because otherwise it takes too long to generate the image. And when the image comes out at a great level, then resolution 2.0. So she pushed the resolution to get great, 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 beautiful results. <clears throat> but it's during the research, she goes in different things and, and then she tests different keywords. And uh, we've been to some, um, some different um, website where you can buy prompts and we tested them. Some are great, some don't, some evolve. So Midjourney 5 needs already new prompts and new way to do. And, uh, and so this is what makes us stronger. And as a team is we have this spell book and we exchange it. So we know what we can do and what we can, and where we say we have the spell for that. And here we don't have the spell, but we suppose we can find the spell. So we need to explore. That's the, the different way to do. So um, I, I love, just to make sure I understand what a spell book is, um, so a spell book is like a standard operating procedure manual, or it's almost like a yeah. glossary of prompts where you collect all the best prompts for all the different use cases that a designer might come across uh, in their day-to-day -day work. And the reason you call it a spell book is because AI is like magic, that you put in words and it creates beautiful images and that you're borrowing in this spell book from prompts that you're finding all over the internet, some that you're purchasing, some that you're, uh, people are sharing freely. Uh, there is definitely a community out there sharing prompts and what the results are. And then you are essentially keeping that as proprietary information because that is your secret sauce. That is your, your spell book. And so what I would encourage all of you to do, is, you know, this is what a great high level, you know, marketing agency in Switzerland does. But we can all begin building our own spell books and begin to collect our own sets of prompts and then train our teams on them and encourage our teams to contribute to them and have this be kind of a living document where we all learn from each other and get better and better. And that, that spell book will be what allows you to continue to pay, get paid for your work. Because remember, in this future, it's not AI versus human, it's AI plus human versus human alone. And the difference between being AI plus human versus human alone is a spell book. Exactly. And, and um, I'm going with you there because um, I, I can tell you the, the, there's something that is beautiful with the idea of a spell book is that you can just build your own. For example, uh, me, when I write an email and I, if I ask ChatGPT to write an email, I'm highly dyslexic. So I make uh, rocky mistakes. And when I, so for me, AI has changed my life because I don't need to ask a colleague to reread my email before I send it to have no, um, no spell check mistake in it. So what I did is then I said, okay, but write me this email, but then it doesn't have my style. So then I, I describe, 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 describe my style. And now I have in one of my notes, my description of my style. And then I say, write me this email. This is my style. And then it comes out and I'm like, Ooh, it's like me. It feels like me. So I've got my little prompt for my style um, of talking that I feel like it's my style. It's a bit of clothes that I can put. And then I have another one that is super business-like, another one that is I'm annoyed. Like this, I've got my three prompts to use to not have to be in the mood to get the results. And so you can do that just, uh, I use Evernote, you can use Note, you can use Google, whatever you want, just write it. Um, then I, I ask my designers, uh, and the reason why you don't have one of our designers is because they are scared of presenting and they are, and I love doing it, but they, they really, I asked them to come and they were like, no, 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 it's in English. It's, uh, and they speak super good English, but they don't feel at ease. So I asked them, so what is it? And for them, they say, it's not a new tool like Illustrator or uh, Photoshop or um, InDesign. It's more in the Getty and iStock range. So there is Getty, iStock, Shutterstock, and now there's generative AI. So it's a new tool for images. So Photoshop for poster, ads, et cetera, illustrators, logo, map, signage, in design, you do brochure, flyers, et cetera. And Meet Journey is like the new tool that made image in a different way, but it's just a tool. And 
when I use, um, <clears throat> when I see what my colleagues bring out, it's awesome. It's a bit like when the iPad Pro came out with the pen and I saw the beautiful drawing, I said, oh, I'm buying an iPad Pro. And now I go to, when I meet clients, I'll draw them what I want to do. I stopped doing that because it looks shit because I'm bad at drawing. And so I'm bad at drawing with an iPad Pro too. But my colleagues who are great at drawing, they do it and it's amazing. It's, it's like in an ad. So it's a bit the same thing. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you will see that um, basically the, the stack of an element that we have had in 2022 was that. But what comes on top now uh, is we have for original, so for Photoshop Illustrator and InDesign, there are no tool that replace them. And because they just bought for 20 billion Figma, I think we are far away from saying anything, any company trying to compete with them. But the original image for photo or photo shoot before we had either original image with photo shoot, but we could use stable diffusion, DALI image journey, plus other tools. And for existing images, we had Getty, iStock, Shutterstock. And now we have stable diffusion, DALI image journey. So it's a bit in, the be in between. And they had a very good way to present it to me and why they like or dislike. Uh, if you go to the next slide, they said uh, one of the designer that is the more reluctant one to play with, he was like, mm, no, me, big artist, I don't touch those shit. And uh, then he played with it. And then I said, but refine your prompt, be patient. So, because he was like, look, I did that, it looks terrible. So I said, yes, but refine. And then he refined, refine, refine. And I saw in his eyes, he was like, and then he played with it. So he, he told me the way I feel is before my job was either you ask me to be a curator. So I go to stock photo and I choose the image that represents the most what we're going to do. That's my curator job. Or option number two, we have the budget. They trust me. I'm a painter. I'm going to choose the casting. That's my, I'm going to choose some actors or models. I'm going to choose my photographer and I'm going to do art direction. So I'm the painter and I've got paints that are the decor or the people. And I've got a photographer that is the Canva or the style. And I'm the painter. And now what is coming up is he say, now I have to be a sculptor because in generative AI, it's a bit like sculpting wood. You don't know that in the middle, they're going to be a nod and you're going to have to play with it. You, you cannot just uh, ignore it or say, no, no, I continue to, to knock because it's not a tool you completely control like a photo shoot. And you say, it's a bit of feeling of a sculpture. And someday he wants to be a sculpture and someday he doesn't. And, um, and uh, Alex loves being a sculpture. Uh, she loves interacting with the material. So Mid Journey is more like wood. You can play with it. It's, it's fun. There's lots of resources. It evolves fast. Um, and uh, and uh, then um, DALI and stable diffusion are more like marble. It's longer and harder to do, but uh, it, it's working. Um, and using um, generative AI, it doesn't make us designer. Like I've, we did, we did, uh, we, we are 50 people and we did team of three. And for two hours, everyone had a training uh, about how to use the spell book. And for 40 minutes, they tried to design themselves. And then we give them the spell book, train in the spell book. It's very easy. Every team that had a designer with them had outstanding results. Any team without a designer generate a lot of fun. We laughed a lot, but nothing was presentable to our client. We decided to show everything to our client to say that was an experiment on your brand. We played with it. It's catastrophe. We did. It's just, but look what we learned. Look how it started. And huh? it was very interesting. Um, so here you have the the, the different uh, element. Um, they will have a physical AI art gallery now. Yeah, why not? I, I'm i sure that there's so many ways to play with it and to enjoy it. Um, I'm sure that they're gonna, there's already artists using AI. Yeah, and uh, it, absolutely, uh, art, art, AI art is winning art competitions. So let's move on to tactical advice and then we're gonna do a mid journey. We're gonna show you how to sculpt with wood uh, with Jeff here in a sec. So uh, if you could just give us uh, a little bit of tactical advice and then um, some of the best lessons that you've learned in your experiences, Olivier, with you and your team with uh, Mid Journey. Yeah, so with AI. To switch tool. Um, because what I see sometimes is people trying to do everything in Mid Journey or everything in Delhi. And no, if you want text, 
um, you have to take the image, go in Photoshop, put the text, or in Illustrator, or in, in design. Um, if you want to add a logo, Illustrator is better. So it, it's like there is a moment to switch tool. And yes, I'm Swiss. And yes, uh, the Victorinox knife is from my country. And yes, in theory with it, you can open a ravioli, ravioli box with it. But in practice, it takes an hour and a half. So it's much better to use, um, I don't know how you say, um, something to open one of those uh, uh, can, can, can opener, can opener uh, than a Victorinox tool. So today you can try to do everything with Midjourney, but what it does, it's better images. So don't try to write a book with it. It's great at illustration, much better than doing photo, but it, it's amazing at illustration. So learn to switch tools. And all the, um, all, all the things I'm giving you today are today, maybe in two weeks or in a month or in 24 hours, some stuff will change. Um, today, we cannot use AI for subtle emotion. So it means that every time we do a concept, an advertising concept, where we need very subtle emotion from the, from the models, uh, we have to go in a photo shoot because this very subtle emotion we have find so far, no way to prompt um, any of those tools to give subtle emotion. They're always very neutral, so you can imagine an emotion, or they go far too much, like scared, uh, happy. They, they, there's not those subtle uh, light things. So that's what we are missing. Um, and um, yeah, so what I would like you to go with and what I can give you is let's be humble and patient. It started the 30th of it started the 30th of November. That's less than 160 days ago that those tools are have an interface that makes it fun to play with. Remember that for computer, it was when the mouse appeared. It took 10 years before we tried really to use it. Build a spell book. Just because by building it, I'm 100 percent sure that any if we all build a spell book, most probably only one of us will have a spell book usable in a year or in a year and a half. And most probably all of them will have to be replaced. But by building that, you create the consistency and the logic that makes you uh, understand how it works and be a cyborg. Uh, really, that's the key that we've learned so fast. Uh, if, if I would share data with you about community management, about SEO, about um, con like every time you do only AI, I'll, human that can outbeat, outbeat it today, we don't know what's coming, but when we mix, if you do the first 80% of the work with AI and finalize with a human, you add beat the human by a fold of two or three or four. So enjoy. And um, I'm, I can answer any question. And, and uh, I'm really happy that I've shared that with you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, beautiful job. Um, if you guys have any questions, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, and Olivier will stick around and answer those. Um, I just want to say that I think the special intelligence of humans is different than the intelligence of artificial intelligence. And so I don't see a near future where uh, cyborgs get beaten by artificial intelligence, um, unless it's for tasks that artificial intelligence are better at by nature. So I think it, the cyborg uh, metaphor where you're a human plus AI, uh, is I think one that's going to last for a little while. Now, technology will make me eat these words, perhaps, uh, but I, I don't think so. I think humans have a kind of associative intelligence that is extremely difficult to program inside of a computer. Hey, Dan, we have a couple of questions real quick for Perfect. Olivier. Um, we have, uh, do you have people on your team sign NDAs to protect your spellbook content? So I have talents, but I really, I'm bad at, at thinking about those problems. So I don't have, I, I should. I think that it's something that I'm missing today in my company is today we are not protecting what we do. So it's true that I thought about it when you put ask the question. Today, if I have one of my employees leaving the company, I have nothing to prevent him to copy the spell book and play with it. So I hope that people stay loyal and I hope that we go faster than the copy that will be done. But today I have, it, it's, it's something we should think about, but I, I haven't worked on it, but it's very intelligent to do so. 
Thank you. Well, well, just really quickly to address that, sorry, you know, you have standard operating procedures and operational manuals that are copyrightable and that you own and that people can sign non-disclosure agreements. And if they take those in the United States, at least, and use them in another job, you can sue them for that. Uh, that's called, uh, you know, industrial espionage. Espionage. So at least in the United States, um, that you cannot steal a playbook and use it with your competitor. That is uh, a, a clear violation of intellectual property, and most employment agreements protect against that. Uh, back over to you, you Nicole. Um, so Olivier, well, what software did you use to build your spellbook? So, so, so that's the fun part is everyone works with what they like. So for example, for me, I love working in a Google uh, suite. So I put all my prompt in it, but because it's designer, they did it in Figma. And I was like, this is a very bad way to classify it, but it's a bit like, it, it, it wasn't, it's a prototype. It's not, she didn't build, like the spellbook was super good and useful, but she didn't know it would be super good and useful. She was just like, okay, I need to put my thought on a mind map. If I would have done it, I would have used a mirror board or a Google slide because that's what I use. But because she's in Figma every day, Alex started in Figma. And because she started in Figma, now we continue with Figma, but it makes absolutely no sense. We, we should use something where we can categorize and search. It's just, you know, we are with our stick and scissors and we are trying and then we are gonna organize. But for now it's there. Awesome, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Great. Um, so, so in this next section, we are going to do a very brief, brief demo of Midjourney. So this is a pretty complicated tool. This is uh, something that requires you to know a couple of different tools in the process. And so um, I wanna confirm you guys can see my screen okay and we'll get started giving you a brief overview. Of Looks great. This tool. Looks great. Thanks, Dan. Um, okay, so before we dive in, I guarantee you will be confused about what I'm doing if you are not already have a baseline familiarity of some of this software. Discord is an important system for you to know. This is Discord is nothing special. If you have a niece or nephew or child who plays video games, go ask them what Discord is and how to use it, and they can tell you. Discord is actually a chat and video communication tool that's actually very popular in the video game community and has recently become very popular with things like cryptocurrencies or software development, et cetera. You can kind of think about it like Slack. Discord is a free tool you can use. And the way Midjourney works is it actually is a separate platform that creates a robot that you can chat with and interact with in Discord. So what you're about to see is I'm going to share my screen and I have my Discord environment set up where I have a server on Discord. I will share a link later for how you can set that up. And I will be talking to like I would talk to a human, a robot called the Midjourney robot. And that's what you're about to see. And that is how you use Midjourney right now. So I'm sure there will be questions. I will do my best to answer them at a high level. And in the short term, I just want to show you how this tool works in action. So um, the first thing I'll do is because this tool, like Olivier mentioned, can take a little while to render images, I'm going to just go ahead and get it started very quickly while we go look at some examples I already had worked through. Um, that way we can check back in at the end of this demo to see if it works. So right now I'm in a chat interface with Midjourney right now in a tool called Discord. And the way that I prompt the AI to do something is I type in this imagine command. So I'm doing slash imagine, and it allows me to put in a prompt. You can put in a very simple prompt like we saw before, like red car, but you can also create really complex prompts. And I sent a link in the chat to an online prompt library where you can see some of the things that, that people are doing. In this case, what I'll do is I'm just going to tell it to produce a dog flying through the air with a cape. Let's do it, the air with a cape with dramatic lighting. And I'm telling it to do an aspect ratio of 16 to 19, which is basically just going to make the image a certain size, 16 by nine, sorry. So we'll go ahead and get that kicked off. What happens when you chat with this robot is it says, okay, I've heard you. And then it will slowly start to produce an image that can take anywhere between 30 seconds and maybe a minute and a half. So while we're waiting for that robot to, to wake up, let's go take a look at some other stuff I've already done. You can see it's actually gonna slowly start producing this image here. We'll come back to this. 
So in this example, this is what you'll see when you start working with a tool like Midjourney. So in this example, I made up a use case. I said, what if I wanted to redo the illustration on our marketing website? So in this first I, first prompt, I just asked the tool to give me an illustration for a search engine marketing website. And without any other information, it actually does a fairly good job providing some really nice hand illustrated things. Some of the things you can do with this tool is similar to how Nicole was showing us for language models like ChatGPT, you can get more specific. So in this next prompt, I said, okay, well, let me be a little more specific. Let me give, give me a search engine marketing illustration for a tech company by Slack and Dropbox in the style of Behance, which is a, a company where I really like their design style. And I told it to produce it with an aspect ratio of 16 to nine, and it gives me back these samples. What you're seeing is that you always get four images back from this particular tool. That's something called batching, which we won't cover in this, in this lecture, but if you wanna go deep down that rabbit hole, you can send me a message. Um, so in this example, now they've changed the style and I like this actually a little better. What Midjourney also gives you the option to do is once you have a set of images like this, you can ask for specific variations. Um, you can also prompt Midjourney with an image. So in this case of this illustration, I actually liked an illustration we already had on our website that looked like this. So I said, let me just let me just go ahead and send in an image as a prompt with my original uh, written prompt. So in this case, I gave it the image and said, give me a search engine marketing illustration for the website. And it now produced images that are done much more in the artistic style of the image that I sent in as one of my prompts. So you can actually prompt these tools with both language and images. And you'll see if you're ever out Googling or using a tool like Stable Diffusion, or some of the tools we'll talk about in our lesson about videos, it's very common to do image to image prompting in these image tools and not just use text. So in this example, I liked this style better. And I said, hey, I'm, I like this picture in the top right. And I asked Midjourney to actually create different variations of just that one image. So it gave me a sample and I said, produce a bunch of similar versions. And now I've got here, what looks fairly chaotic, a bunch of different examples using that same design with small permutations. And some of these examples, I've got a person, you know, touching a touch screen. Some examples, I have a person, I guess, reaching into a box or digging a random hole. So by itself, again, like Olivia, Olivier was saying, these aren't perfect, but they're really good inspiration for the, for the first part of this design process. Once you do a variation like this, you can then have the, the machine upscale it. So like Olivier was saying, you can have it produce larger images with higher resolution and get to an end state where I now have an image I can give to my designer or go over to Photoshop with and start working off of as an existing um, asset that we use in our website production. So I did see a few questions about how we were prompting. So we do use that imagine command and that was what was used for all of these examples. The way that this works is once, once I put that in, it, the response just removes that from the response. So you actually, I actually did type imagine. It's just not showing once it gives us the response back since there was some questions. Um, you can use stock images as prompts, like if someone asked about Getty, but you have to make sure that you own the copyright. So you can't just use a free image from Getty Images. But if you have an account and you've purchased the, the rights to that image, you can use that as a prompt. So going back to the original example, we put in that dog flying through the air with a cape and dramatic lighting and actually got some pretty cool stuff. So that took, I don't know if you noticed while I was talking, but that took about 50 seconds for that to produce that image. And so right now this tool is, is very useful for that creative stage, but it's not by itself going to be something I'll probably use in the wild without taking it through a design process with Photoshop or edits. There, there is one thing I do want to touch on before closing out this demo, because I think someone mentioned, I think it was Ken in an earlier slide with those examples of the older man that it really generated, all of these systems generated pictures of white men. And there, there's a big challenge that we have as humans with the structural bias and historic bias that's in all of this training data that feeds into these tools and it starts to reinforce itself. And it can be pretty dangerous. And so we, as people, need to be very focused on making sure that when we train these machines, when we build these machines, that we are making sure we're training them with that diverse group of, of imagery from different cultural backgrounds. This is true of image models and language models. And it's not just because we have an ethical reason to do this, which there's some really amazing content 
out there will share on the ethics of some of these things, but also the tools work a lot better when we have a really diverse group of training data and we produce these. And I want to give you an example of this. My wife- um, just, is- just, uh, Sorry, just one quick point before you go to that. Could you go back to the dog image? Sure. You know, what, what John is, uh, what Jeff is saying is, is kind of not controversial. Like if you look at that, and I don't, I'm not great on my dog breeds, but you wrote dog, you didn't write which breed, and it came out with three or four different breeds and, or maybe even mutts. Um, and that is uh, biased against poodles, you know, and Rottweilers and my favorite dogs. And so what we're trying to say is that whatever dogs are most popular, whatever dogs have the most photographs on the training set are going to be the dogs that are going to be generated when you create the learning model. And, and one of the pernicious things about these learning models is it's very expensive and time consuming to train them. And so once they're trained, you then need to, uh, on the initial data set, that's locked in and then you need to train them about the outputs. And that's where Honestly, I think a lot of the bias work is going to happen is in what comes after the learning model is built and now it's outputting stuff and we need to teach it. Hey, when we say dog, you know, don't always show us uh, golden retrievers and lassie like dogs. That's that's not the reflecting the full diversity of what dog means. Maybe even they get smarter and they say, what kind of dog do you want? And so they ask us a question back so they can reflect. So they can refine the prompt and give us something a little more like what we need. Sorry, you were going to share about your wife. Yeah, absolutely. So my wife is is a data scientist for Disney. So occupationally, what she does all day is programs and creates algorithms for Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN. She is a quintessential data scientist. If I put into MidJourney right now her image and the prompt data scientist, I got out this image. Which what's going on here is is... Midjourney has studied images of data scientists and believe they should be men with mustaches. And so even if I put in my, my beautiful wife's image as the prompt for a data scientist who is a quintessential data scientist, you start to see this stuff in the wild. And, and I would argue that, that the responsibility for us, even though the reinforcement learning is extremely important, the training is also very important too, because part of what's happening, I just went to Google and searched for male model because I'm thinking of Zoolander right now. And if you look at the results, this is a machine that was trained like MidJourney is going to go and scrape the internet for pictures of male models. And you can see right here, this is not a very diverse representation. We have some white men, some black men. I don't see any people from AAPI heritage or anything diverse here. And there's this is this is part of the problem. And so there are a lot of really good initiatives going on right now, both with the companies that are that are producing these tools to help with the reinforcement learning, but also with research institutions to try to create broader, better data sets that we can use as a human race to create tools that are less biased in practice. And right now they are biased. So as you're using them, please be careful and please consider the ethics of what you're producing. Thank you very much, Jeff. I know you need to go. Thank you for the extra time. We're going to go a little long today. We just have a lot to cover. And I want to make sure that we get to Nicole, who has some really important things to share. Uh, Nicole, uh, let's start with a Canva demo uh, demo and then we can go into other areas okay um i will do a screen share for you real quick this is your homework a lot of people are using canva that are in this group it's kind of it's our shortcut for all things graphic design i actually went to school for graphic design and i still love canva because it makes it so much easier and so accessible to everyone Canva has apps over here on the left, and it has an AI app. So I just, I can select the app over here and I tell it what to do. And you're not going to get mid-journey quality, and you will get something you can play with. So for us, I would say, like with AI smart marketing, um, we do a lot we talk a lot about so posting to social media. So I'm going to do social media icons. And I'm going to say I want them in purple. Let's see, bright, pink, and purple. And floating in space in Dolly style. And let's see what it gives me. 
and this will take just a moment. Um, and somebody asked in the questions, if two people put in the same prompt, will they get different answers or will they get different visuals? And you could get different visuals day to day. You may get similar visuals, um, but we use the same even verbal prompts from week to week and we test some of them and we'll get different results. So the, the tool's evolving because so many people are using it. And I would say if you are curious, just test it side by side with a friend. Um, this is, these are not great. Like this is okay, but it's not great. So now I'm going to, down here, there's different styles I could do. Maybe let's try a watercolor and we're gonna include dark, pink and purple. Cause that does not, I've done this same prompt before and I got different results that were way better than what I just got today. <laughs> So we always like to test and see what's going on here. Oh, here's watercolor and I don't see any social media icons. Well, maybe a hint. So that's not a great one. Um, let's try this style. And this is the thing about AI and what Olivier has done so well is they have a playbook of do this and this and this to get these types of results. And in this case, we would just keep playing with it until we get results that we would want. But I don't even think that this, like this is not the best stuff I've gotten from this tool at all. Um, so Canva AI, I'm a little disappointed today. Um, and sometimes that happens. We had a super prompt that was really good and gave us excellent results. And then one week just stopped working from a, a verbal perspective. Um, but your homework this week is to go to Canva and try this out. So a lot of people have Canva accounts and the app is free in there. Um, and you can just experiment with it. Perfect. And would you show people again where you found this just in case they weren't paying attention? Yeah, on the left-hand navigation, there's a little apps icon and it, it shows the panda. This The AI text to image is the first one that usually pops up for people because yeah. it's popular right now. Would you put red car just out of curiosity? Okay. Uh, uh, you know that you guys will recall that Jeff had shared the evolution of Mid Journey's red car. So I'm curious to see what Canva AI uh, how it compares and how it went. In, you know, in Mid Journey from uh, 1.0, which was not photorealistic, to what is now photorealistic, and that looks so pretty good. Yeah, red car, we get a variety of red cars. We didn't specify what kind, but yeah. Yeah, and you'll cool. notice the structural racism of the Porsche. <laughs> we didn't tell it which car and it showed us a Porsche, but I drive a jalopy. I don't I don't appreciate that. Where's my Ford Focus? <laughs> Let's see, red car. Ford Focus in oh, thank you. Miami. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the point that we're making is that it's trained on certain images, I guess, red. Uh, there's probably a lot of red Porsches. And so let's see what we've got. That definitely looks like Miami. And that definitely looks like a Focus hatchback. At least the bottom right one does. I could live with those. There you go. That looks like my car was gray. But other than that, it's perfect. Well, and it cuts off the front and the back in that one. So then you'd have to specify that you want the whole car with the background around it to give it. And you could even specify the padding on the edges of how much extra space you want to give it on the edges. Um, and so you don't have to be an expert in this. What you need to do is be curious and be curious about how to communicate the visual style that you want and to look at it, look at it that way. So I would ask for a Ford Focus to take up two thirds of an image and we show the whole car with the background in Miami at the beach at sunset. Um, we did some of these for a client that they could use on a blog post and they were in Texas and we were creating um, outdoor kitchens and bars with fireplaces, pools um, and a flagstone patio. And we had some amazing images that came out of that, but we just had to get more specific because we didn't 
at first we didn't put the location and we had mountains in the background. Well, that's not going to work in Texas. We needed it to look flat, like there's no green mountains in the background anywhere in Texas. Um, Perfect. So, yeah. So, so that's, that's Canva and that's your homework. Um, and uh, we're going to, I'd like to uh, give Nicole a chance to talk a little bit more if you're, if you'd like about other ways you use AI images in your work. So as a reminder, Nicole runs an agency that specializes in AI powered marketing services, and she's been doing it for seven years. So she has seen the kind of evolution from the really um, ghastly, you know, digital demons uh, to the more uh, kind of not quite there, but closer uh, of, of the AI tools now. And she's going to share just a little bit about how she um, uh, is using this with her, her blog and in other areas of her business. Well, I'm not even going to take credit for these because most of these Katie did. She's on in the audience right now and she's our resident artist from this perspective. Um, and we started out doing these images. <laughs> well, this one's kind of funny. We didn't ask it to correct, but she has, you know, three eyes on here. And we started doing videos with AI voices. And we've been experimenting with different tools to do video because then we can take our content, we do an introduction and post it to YouTube of what people are gonna get in our blog posts. And we are doing an experiment in our blog right now where we have a bunch of posts that we did not edit and we wanted to see what pure AI at outputs would be. And we're working on creating better inputs to get better outputs, but we also wanna show what unedited outputs look like. We also write our own content, but we really, we wanna show the evolution of AI in our blogs. Um, and this image was Mid Journey created, I'm sure. Um, some more Mid Journey. Yeah. You know, one thing we haven't talked about is that these image generators don't render text very well. Uh, no, they we, don't. we saw that in the business leader icon at the very beginning, but um, they cre kind of invent this weird invented language um, that doesn't look normal at all. Um, and, and so you'll notice that those letters in that uh, image that you just were showing are not actually all English letters. No, they're not even real letters. Sometimes they're just shapes based on what the shape of a letter would be. Um, and it's not a letter in any language. And you look at the people in here. Her face is kind of smushed into the screen. Um, but look at these people. And that's, you know, AI generated. And Katie has fun with doing the different prompts. I think that's, it's a great image. Yeah, so if you wanna get some inspiration, you can go to the blog and just check out the different types of images that are here. Um, we will be sharing some more prompts. I've actually created a prompt in AI PRM for, uh, a little marketing prompt. So AI PRM is a publicly, you can have a public available prompts where you can save them and make them available to other people. And you can get mid journey prompts in there and you can get prompts for any kind of copy you wanna write, even grant writing, things like that. Um, but we're, the thing somebody asked was if you do a prompt you know, does it always give you the same results? And um, Jessica, that was, sorry, that was the pro version of Canva. I'm not sure what the free version looks like if you have the apps on it. Um, but the prompts, you might, you may get different answers from week to week because AI is changing so much, like the red car. And so you just need to stay curious and keep asking yourself, more of what you're looking for and you'll get really good at prompting. It'll also make you better at communicating with your clients and with your team members as you get better at talking to AI and being really clear about what your expectations are. 
and what the outputs are that you want. Yeah, now that's an interesting one, right? Because the, the image of the uh, astronaut that you were just showing reminds mm -hmm. me a lot of the image that Olivier uh, used with one of his clients. And I was curious, um, did, did you didn't do that one with Olivier, that one you did independently, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so here's where one of the risks comes in is if you're not creative in your prompting and your competition or other people are doing the same prompts, you're going to get similar looking images. And those similar looking images are kind of like when the, uh, when you're a cybersecurity company and you have the picture of the hacker with a hoodie and it's like every cybersecurity camera has like literally the exact same stock photo that they bought from Shutterstock with that same exact hacker. Like all hackers clearly are men with hoodies, right? Because that's what yeah. every image on every cybersecurity. And if you want to kind of laugh, go Google cybersecurity and just start finding all the places on all the websites where they all use the exact same image. And there's a kind of risk, I would say, for AI content like that, because, you know, uh, you know, Olivier and Nicole, um, who, uh, you know, live uh, almost as far apart as you possibly can, Nicole is in uh, Vancouver uh, and Olivier is in Switzerland are using identical images and they're just hoping their uh, your clients don't notice but um, that's that's the, the 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 that's where the AI plus human is always going to be required right because you bring your humanity into this um, in, in a way that no uh, bot uh, ever will be able to uh, until um, we get to a, a kind of scary universe that is what uh, Elon Musk is warning us about. So um, I want to uh, wrap up here. Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, uh, and I want to make sure that we have time to go over the homework and, and review. Uh, those of you who haven't yet, please, um, there's a poll that we've asked uh, requesting you to let us know how we did and also inviting you to join some of the bonus and info sessions that we're doing. Um, your homework, uh, as we discussed, this is a class after all, is to create an image for a blog post using Canva or Midjourney. Um, there is potentially a price, uh, small price uh, to get the advanced version of Canva, Canva or the $20 a month version of Midjourney. So there is, this isn't something you can necessarily do with free tools. Uh, but um, if you want to use... So note on that, Jessica said that she has the free version of Canva and it worked in there. Okay, so there you go. So using Canva... Uh, the free version. And there is a mid-journey version that's free as well. Uh, it's limited and often you're going to get re reported back to you that there's uh, they're not able to actually service you because they're servicing their paid clients first. So let's wrap up. First, I want to review what we've covered in this nearly two-hour session. Uh, first, we talked about your homework. Uh, your homework for this past week was to write a sales email. Uh, many of you shared some of the stories that you, of how you wrote that sales email. You might recall in session one that we spoke to Brett Spodak, who actually used it to write personalized sales emails that were uh, much more effective uh, because they scraped uh, publicly available information about mission and focus and then wrote a personalized introductory paragraph, which is always the key. Um, I also got a sales email this week where it said, Dear Dan Gretsch, I spoke to your colleague, Dan Gretsch, and he suggested you might be interested in hearing from me. Uh, and then it said at the bottom, this is sales GPT in an AI generated uh, email. And it was just really annoying. Um, and so then they wrote me back the next day and said, dear Dan Gretsch, I'm sorry I used both your first and last name in the email. I should have just said, dear Dan. Uh, and then it said, I spoke to your colleague, Dan Gretsch. And he said, so it's just like, come on, man. Like that is so offensive and uh, insulting. Uh, so I had ChatGPT write an offensive email back to them. And then I sent that and made sure they knew it was written by ChatGPT. Um, we talked about Loeb, and Loeb is the stand-in for the Frankenstein weird hands, weird eyes, you know, uh, aged Nicole images that uh, with crow's feet uh, that she doesn't have um, that that these AI generators are creating. We, uh, you know, my my little buddy uh, with the small giant with his funky thumb, and and all the other things that AI is doing right now that kind of have us land in that uncanny valley that space where we feel just profoundly uncomfortable with what we're seeing. Now, as we cross that chasm 
out of the uncanny valley, we're starting to get into the world of deep fakes. And this is a scary place to be because, you know, Russian hackers and scam artists are going to be using these tools and already are using these tools to completely fake it out and I mean even even in presidential elections um, there have been deep fakes that have influenced debate and changed people's points of view you know so this is a real issue and it's going to become more and more of an issue as these tools get better and better and that when people are sounding the alarm bells deep fakes is one of the big alarm bells is that the better that generative AI gets at faking reality the scarier it's going to become and we're going to be able to make the Pope look like he's in a puffer jacket and uh, we, we won't know that it was generative AI that created that. And we won't know that it wasn't real because most of us right now experience reality mediated through media. And so we're gonna be in this kind of crazy fact checking place where we're constantly trying to check, check facts on, on imagery. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, imagery has largely been a space that was fact check free. Uh, and we're gonna have to develop whole new tools and whole new disciplines and whole new companies to, to check that this is actually uh, a real picture. We talked about the state of AI for images and how generative AI images, AI for images works. It, we pointed out that it's very, very similar to the kind of learning algorithms where you, that we saw with text that you can basically feed it a bunch of images and outputs um, and, and then it analyzes the imagery and then it outputs images that are similar to that. And that these tools are already quite advanced when it comes to non-generative AI, just normal artificial intelligence to help establish and understand things in medical settings uh, and other settings. What, what's really happening now is generative AI, where we're creating new imagery, is advancing very rapidly. Um, the AI or not AI shows that we went from a world where images were flawed to now they're too perfect. And, you know, that famous... Uh, you know, supermodel Cindy Crawford, who had, you know, the mole on one of her, uh, above one of her lips. Um, if you take that mole away, she's less beautiful. And so part of what makes beauty uh, human and otherwise is in asymmetry. Uh, and too symmetrical is actually a little jarring, is a little uncanny. And AI is going to learn that too. So you'll start to see imperfect images created by AI, not because it's failing, but because it's doing it intentionally. Um, and then Olivier showed how with uh, some very talented graphic designers and a little bit of touching up and tweaking in Photoshop, uh, he's been able to save tens of thousands of dollars for his client and do photo shoots that would not have been possible uh, if not for AI because both his budget was too small and the time before the event was too small for them to be able to do it the, 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 the typical and the old fashioned way. Um, and his tactical advice uh, is really more than anything to be a cyborg, to be someone who's trained on these tools and understands them and how to use them effectively, uh, to not try not to use this for subtle emotions um, and to really partner with not only AI, but someone with a graphical uh, bent, whether that's you or someone on your team. Uh, I know in my company, I'm very text oriented and we struggle therefore with generative AI for images. And that's kind of a little bit of a gap that's emerging on our team. Uh, and that we saw the most popular and what at least for now we would say is the best of the big three in, in generative AI, which is mid journey. You have to use uh, a um, Discord, which is another software to access mid journey. I, I don't understand the technical reason behind that, but but so you have to first get into Discord and then use Midjourney. Uh, but I was able to figure it out um, within about 10 minutes. I'm pretty technically savvy. So it, it is discoverable. And then we're gonna also share in our resources in the chat and next week, uh, tutorials on how to get into Discord and then how to get started with Midjourney. Um, and for me, when I tried to use Midjourney on the free level, it, it didn't, it said there was no server. So I had to pay for the, uh, $20 a month uh, campaign, and now I, I, I was able to use the tool. And it worked really well, and it was really fun, except for the little kid's thumb. And then we talked about Canva. Canva is kind of, I would say, your gateway drug, if you will, to this tool. Most of us are using Canva, and we love it. And there's just tucked away in the apps uh, menu is the way to use generative AI. So you might as well get started with that as part of your homework uh, and start using an image for a blog or uh, to embed it in email. Um, and so with that, uh, I want to say thank you. Um, 
Uh, Olivier, uh, we, we like to go through the ahas. Uh, what, what kind of stood out for you uh, from a learning perspective? And then I'll ask Nicole the same question. What did you learn today uh, in being part of today's session about AI for images that you can take home with your team? Oh, um, I actually, there are some slides that you did that are really, really cool, good at the start to explain and the difference between uh, DALI, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and the way it's built and the fact that it goes, that the system it used to analyze images is the system it used to generate images. So um, try to use the filter the other way and you understand why some mistake happens. And, um, and that, that for me is a, a big aha. And I, I thank you very much because it's, it's really great. I, I learned stuff during your presentation. Thank you for that. Nicole? This week, I mean, it reinforced for me the importance of having a variety of inputs like different cultures, different races, ethnicities. I I mean, we need everyone who is not a white male to do more inputs, you know, do more visual inputs, just putting in pictures of what you look like, what your friends look like, um, so that we can have more diverse outputs or even requesting the outputs to look more like you. Um, yeah, that's it's so important. It's so important to get all of those cultural inputs and outputs. You know, and 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 I don't think it's an accident that it gave you crow's feet around your eyes that were not appropriate. You know what I mean? Like that is probably in part because it wasn't trained properly. Um, and so it's so important the work that you are doing, Nicole, um, to help kind of bring sort of at least more gender diversity into this field. Um, I thought it was actually really telling uh, when, for me, my biggest aha was actually one of the last things we saw, which is when Jeff shared the image of his, his wife, who is a data scientist, and, uh, and how uh, basically AI is biased about their opinion being that data scientists are men. And that they were given an image of a data scientist, and they couldn't interpret it as such. And that... Uh, is is a big part of what we're trying to say here is every image and every piece of text that is produced by AI is biased by definition, by the data on which it was trained. And you have a responsibility as a business leader to understand on what data that specific tool was trained so that you can at least know what the biases may be. So ChatGPT was trained on the internet circa 2021, everything on the internet before 2021, nothing more recent. So number one, it's not gonna be very good at current events, but even more importantly, number two, the internet is a reflection of the structural biases in our society, whether those be socioeconomic or gender or race or ethnicity or country of origin. Right, Rich countries tend to produce more content. Rich people tend to produce more content. And so the training is happening on content that has some of the same structural biases uh, as, the, as the world as a whole. And we're gonna continue to hit this theme uh, every week as we go, uh, because it is essential for you to be able to use this tool effectively to understand you know, what are the biases of AI? And so you can at least be aware of them and hopefully mitigate them. I wanted to share this parting thought, and this is an ode to the small giants community. The small giant uh, community is all about being great rather than big. And this is an ode to the small giant in all of us. It's, it's a poem by Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you to not to be? Who are you not to be? So go out there, be your brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous selves, and we will see you at Masterclass 4 next Wednesday, May 9th at 12.30, we're going to have a senior engineer from Microsoft here talking about 
Microsoft's vision for AI, how the Fortune 100 companies are using AI and how you can apply AI to your own business. We look forward to seeing you there. Take care. And thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Mike and Jonathan. Really appreciate you. And thanks to the several hundred of you who stuck around to the end. We appreciate you guys. You're troopers, nearly two hours with us. And here you still are. Thank you. Au revoir.